So as we're going to be discussing today, one of the big pieces of political news from this week is that President Biden and former President Trump have settled on terms to have two debates. And while that might be exciting for some of us in the news, I think there are a lot of Americans who aren't so excited about this. They say, you know, does anyone really need this? Do we need to see another Biden versus Trump debate? So given that reaction, who do you think would make for a better debate? Like if there were a nationally televised debate between any two individuals today, who would it be? Any two individuals? Yes. Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie. Ooh. (laughs) That's a deep cut and would be highly stressful for everyone. Aaron, how about you? First of all, I I don't like the debate hating. Debates are great. This is an important part of our deliberative process as a country. But if I weren't so excited about actually having debates, I would say maybe like Drake against Kendrick Lamar. I feel like that's something that people would want to do right now. I was like, there's only one right answer to this question, and it's Drake versus Kendrick. I swear, if they had them come out at the beginning of this debate to do like 10 minutes of a pre-debate, the ratings on this debate would be astronomical. I I had the right answer five years ago. (laughs) (laughs) It's Friday, May 17th, and welcome to this week's episode of The Campaign Moment. I'm Martine Powers, one of the hosts of Post Reports. And I'm Aaron Blake, the senior politics reporter and author of the Campaign Moment newsletter. We're also joined this week by national political reporter Michael Shearer. Hey, Michael. Hey, y'all. Michael, we're so glad to have you this week. Are you also excited about debates? I'm very excited about debates. And referring to your open there, the good news for those people who don't want debates is the way they set these debates up. I think a lot of people won't watch. (laughs) So (laughs) if you wanted to avoid presidential debates this year, what happened in the last few days is actually great for you because you could probably totally avoid it. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so we've got a lot to talk about today. We want to run through some updates about the hush money trial in New York, the testimony of Michael Cohen. We're going to be talking about some updates from the Trump campaign, some new polls that give us a sense of what's happening in some of the swing states, especially Nevada. But first, let's dive in deeper to these debates. As we said, there are going to be two debates, or at least that's what they've agreed to now, the first of which is going to be next month, which is very soon. Um, That's pretty different from what we've had in previous years. So first, let's talk about the timing of this. Like, who does it help that we're getting this first debate so early? It's worth stepping back just to realize how unprecedented this is. You go back to 1960, the first televised debate, all the way forward. Debates are something that happen in the fall after you have major party nominees. Sometimes third party candidates make it, but it happens after the conventions. It's a last minute thing. What's changed in recent years is that people are voting earlier and earlier. Now you can vote for president in early September in some states. So that has shifted things. But the other thing has shifted things is the campaigns have grown over time to dislike these debates because it adds this great element of uncertainty in the final weeks of a campaign. You can Mm -hmm. blow a debate, you can have a great performance, you can freeze up. And I think both candidates want more control over those final weeks. But really what happened this week was that Joe Biden set the terms. And Joe Biden made a proposal, and Trump had previously been public saying, I'll debate him anytime, anywhere, which didn't give him a lot of leverage. And so Joe Biden came out with this proposal and said, here are my conditions, one-on-one. I want to start in June. I want to do these networks. I want to have no audience. I want to do it outside the presidential debate system. And sort of shockingly, surprisingly, within a matter of hours, we had two debates scheduled. I think they're on their way to solidifying a third debate for the vice presidential nominee, Mm -hmm. which will happen probably in late July. And Trump accepted the terms basically as provided. And the only thing he said is, I'd like to do more, but Joe Biden's not going to do more. So that's probably the end of it. Wait, so is y'all sense that this is basically like a big win for Biden? So what we know about the debates right now is that one from CNN is going to be held on June 27th. Another one from ABC News is going to be held on September 10th. These will expectedly be one-on-one debates. And so I think some of these dynamics do favor Biden because of what Michael referenced, you know, the fact that 
Trump basically gave away his leverage on this because he really wants to do the debates. But having the debates themselves is not necessarily something that favors Biden. You know, there's a reason one of these candidates was really pushing hard for these debates. I think for Joe Biden, this is kind of a test that was necessary for him to agree to and potentially pass, but not necessarily something that they would like to be doing. You know, I think the fact that there's going to be no audience for these debates is probably good for Biden because Trump really likes to play to a crowd. And can you talk about that for a second? Because I found that really surprising. I feel like an audience is a basic part of debates, but there's not going to be one, at least in the first one. Yeah, but what we've seen in recent years is a lot of times not only are the candidates playing to the crowd, but the crowd can be slanted to one side or another and be applauding a lot for one candidate, but not another and booing Mm -hmm. for one candidate, but not for another. So I think in some ways it's healthy not to have an audience there because it kind of takes that dynamic away from things. It forces things to be a little bit more focused on the substance of what they're talking about and less about applause lines and things like that. I'll mention a couple other things. One of the main strategic priorities of Joe Biden from the beginning of this campaign is to wake the American people up to the idea that this is a choice between two people. Even today, there's a significant share of voters who don't want it to be a choice between these two people Mm -hmm. who want something else. And And don't necessarily realize that it is a choice between two people, right? That you hear these reports of people who are still voting for Nikki Haley and like it's unclear whether or not they know that that's not a reality anymore. And Bobby Kennedy is still out there. He's still trying, but it hasn't yet gained traction. So they are getting another big win here. They're going to basically have a big ad run in late June that says this is a race between two people unless Bobby Kennedy can somehow squeeze her way in. And I think we can talk about that, but I think the other candidates will stay home if he does. The second thing I'd mention is the Biden people expect to have a significant financial advantage in this campaign. And that means they will probably have tens, maybe even more than $100 million more money if you include their super PACs, to spend on television in the final months of this campaign. This gives them the advantage. I mean, what a debate is in a presidential election year is free media. It's free airtime. You know, they get clipped. They become news stories. Everybody talks about it over the water cooler for a week. That's gone now from October. Hmm. And so you're leaving the paid advertising, the paid stuff, to really dominate there. Now, Trump has the ability to do rallies. They may get covered, so he may be able to come back against that. But I think the Biden people feel good about that as well. And wait, so Michael mentioned this whole issue of RFK Jr. What is going on with that? Like, is he he not going to be part of these debates? So basically, the situation with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is that the debate criteria is initially announced, allowed for somebody who gets 15 percent in four qualifying polls and is qualifying for the ballots in enough states to win a majority of the Electoral College so they can get enough to actually win the race, they can go on the debate stage. But then the Biden campaign said, look, we actually insisted that this was one-on-one. Trump has suggested that he's okay with RFK Jr. being on stage, but kind of suggested that he'd rather he he wasn't. So it's a really live issue. Do you abide by that initial criteria and potentially let him on the stage? Or do these two campaigns go their own direction if he ultimately does qualify? The thing that's going to keep him off the stage probably is not the polling. It's that he needs qualifying, yeah. the ballot access. Yeah. When you say ballot access, what do you mean? So one of the conditions of the debate is that you are qualified for enough state ballots to get 270 electoral votes. Hmm. So you have a possibility of getting the— I see. So if you haven't even made it onto the ballot in enough states that— Right. And RFK is almost certainly going to get there, but he wasn't expecting to get there by the end of June just because of the way these state deadlines are. So now he's rushing to get those signatures in, and it's not clear if the states will sign off on his signatures in time. Hmm. The bottom line, though, is that I don't think the Biden campaign shows up for a debate that RFK makes. Aaron, I want to go back to what you said at the beginning, which is pushing back against my, like, bleak naysaying that nobody actually cares about the debates. And you are making the case that this is important. People should watch. This is interesting. I remember watching the Trump versus Biden debates in 2020 and, like, the sort of painful moments from that. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you answer that because question? the you question is, the question Supreme is, Court is the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, your, man. Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so list? right. Gentlemen, is, I think. This is, I don't feel particularly eager to relive the, like, cringiness of that. What is the case that you're making for why this is important, people should be watching, and that it will actually potentially have an effect on how people are feeling about this election? These debates haven't been a huge win for the substance of our political process in this country. The first debate in 2020 between Trump and Biden 
especially was a mess. <laughs> you know, they they instituted a mute button for the second debate because there was so much <laughs> talking over that. one another. I mean, that's the point that we got to where this was just kind of ridiculous. I do think, though, that once you kind of work your way through all of that stuff, and there's going to be that stuff in this debate, even though there's no audience and things like that, it is important, though, because we live in such a siloed media ecosystem where Donald Trump basically only gives interviews to Newsmax and Fox News, whose hosts aren't really pressing him for his specifics on issues like abortion, even issues like Israel, where he's left his positions very kind of nebulous. President Biden doesn't give a whole lot of mainstream media interviews, although he's stepping forward to do that a little bit more now. It allows us at least an opportunity to have a real substantial debate on certain issues. We may not get that the whole time, but it at least presents some opportunities to have that in a way that you can't really get with anything else. So maybe I'm being optimistic about what this could be like. It probably won't be a great scene, but it's kind of the only opportunity to get that in a lot of ways. Another thing we don't really know at this point is is who's going to carry this debate. Now, normally in in general election debates, presidential debates, they happen in the fall and every network carries them, all the cable networks, and the stage just has an eagle and a flag or some pattern on it. There's mm-hmm. no branding on the stage. The CNN debate is going to be a CNN debate. It's going to have CNN anchors, it's going to have CNN branding. So is Fox News going to carry that? Is NBC going to interrupt their sitcom that night? I think very likely not. <laughs> very likely not. So you have a very different audience. I see. So that's why you said earlier that you think people aren't going to watch this because in the past this would have been more widely on like lots of different channels and now it's only going to be on one channel. That's right. A very Mm. different construction of what these debates are. Not just that's happening right when people are just getting out of school and going on vacation, but it's just going to be a very, probably a much more narrow audience than you had previously. And, And that changes the nature of what these things mean. And of course, one other question about how this debate might play out, or at least the first one, is where will the hush money trial be at that point? Like, will Trump be a person who has been convicted or exonerated in this hush money trial? What's happening with that? I do want to take a few moments to update folks on that trial because it is zooming along. I feel like I've talked to a lot of our colleagues here at The Post who have said, like, this is all unfolding way faster than we expected, and we could reach the end of this pretty soon. And this week, we saw the prosecution's I don't know if it's a star witness, but potentially the most important witness. Most important uh, witness, for sure. Yes. Yeah, Michael Cohen. Though I think part of the challenge of this week is that it doesn't have the same kind of headline-grabbing quality as Stormy Daniels' account. But of course, what Michael Cohen was essentially there on the stand to say in the prosecution's eyes is that he coordinated a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels and that Donald Trump was a part of that. So, Aaron, can you talk a little bit about, like, what was new in this testimony? Like, what has gone beyond what we expected Michael Cohen to say? Yeah, I don't know if it's gone beyond what we expected him to say, but certainly there were questions about, you know, how he would tie this to Donald Trump. And the other big question in this, which we've spoken about before, is how much you can drive home the idea that this was not just about personal issues for Donald Trump, but also about the election. This is the crime that is allegedly being covered up, according to prosecutors, kind of depriving people of information by falsifying business records to cover up a, an allegation. So they need to focus on the idea that this was about the campaign. And Michael Cohen, at a couple points, made some key statements in that regard. He said at one point that Trump told him, what I want you to do is just push it out as long as you can. Just get past the election. Hmm. Because if I win, it has no relevance. I will be the president. If I lose, I don't even care. There was another point where Michael Cohen testified that Trump told him after the Access Hollywood tape was released in early October of 2016, women are going to hate me. This is really a disaster. Women will hate me. The idea is that this was really geared towards the campaign. And we've seen other testimony that goes in that direction, specifically from National Enquirer executive David Pecker that suggested that this was all about the campaign and not necessarily about personal issues. But to the extent that Cohen can drive that home and that the jurors actually believe him in what he says, that's very important to this case. And he's really the one witness who can drive that home because he was so instrumental in in this. Yeah, but as you say, like, whether the jury believes him, and he is the only witness who's saying that he directly communicated with Trump about hush money payments. And yet, 
I think you could look at who he is and his history and where he's at right now and say, like, this is clearly someone with an axe to grind who, like, no longer is loyal to Trump and is, like, actively trying to make Trump look bad. To what extent do you think that he came across as a, like, believable narrator in all this? I think for the large part, Cohen was very well coached on this. He didn't get animated on the witness stand as he was facing his cross-examination. Um, but the defense is working with a lot of material here. There's a lot in his past, including lying to Congress, pleading guilty to that crime. And then on Thursday, we had a very key moment here where the cross-examination seemed to draw blood a little bit more than they had before and basically accused Michael Cohen of having lied in his testimony earlier in the week. Basically, the bare bones of it is that there is a, a phone call that was in October of 2016 where Michael Cohen said that he had reached out to Trump's bodyguard, Keith Schiller, to talk about the Stormy Daniels payment. The defense produced text messages that came just before this phone call that suggested that Cohen was actually texting with Schiller about another issue, which was the harassment that he was facing around this time. And the interplay of those texts with the timing of the phone call really suggests that that was actually the purpose of what they were talking about. Trump's lawyers suggested that Michael Cohen may not have actually spoken to Trump on this phone call. It's a very brief call, or at least they suggested it wouldn't have been long enough for them to have talked about both of these things at the same time. So this is a real problem for the prosecution, kind of the biggest example of the defense getting a shot in when it comes to Cohen's credibility. And to the extent that jurors have some reservations about something like this, you know, if that causes them to call into question the rest of Cohen's testimony, that's a pretty big deal. I've been watching this trial through a political lens, and I'm struck by the levels of defenses that that Trump is making. There's the on, on the first level, he denies he ever had an intimate relationship with this porn star. On the second level, he denies that if he did have an intimate relationship and if he did pay money to the porn star, that it was not about the election. And on the third level, and this is actually the noisiest defense he's been making outside the courtroom. The defense is, this is all political. It doesn't matter what I did. I would never be in court otherwise. This is a democratic persecution of me. It's actually a persecution of my voters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting. He's fighting for the jury. He's fighting for voters at home. Hmm. And he's sort of abandoned the original defense. That has been sort of downgraded. And probably that's the least politically salient one now anyway, because everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Everybody already has an opinion of his personal behavior, and his supporters have basically forgiven him for them. And when it comes to that last argument of this is a witch hunt, this is all, you know, a political attack against me, this week we saw that Trump had some allies in making that argument. This kind of series of individuals who showed up outside the courtroom, sometimes inside the courtroom, who were there to basically make the case that this is unfair against Trump. One of those people was former presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, and we have some tape of him from outside the courtroom. This is a sham. This is not the United States of America. This is some third-rate banana republic. If this were happening in another country, we would be laughing at them as a sham democracy. Then there were other surrogates like Senator J.D. Vance. What's going on inside that courtroom is a threat to American democracy, ladies and gentlemen. Speaker Mike Johnson. This is the, the, the fifth week that President Trump has been in court for this sham of a trial. Why is this happening this week? Like, what is happening here? Why are you seeing these people show up to Trump's trial? I think that the optics of it is to drive home that last point, that this is a political event, not a legal event, that this is a political persecution, and that is the job of not just Republicans, but people who are loyal to Trump to stand up and say, this is an attack on our entire system and I'm going to defend the former president. It's also, I mean, there's a veep stakes going on right now. At this point, like, is it a requirement that if you plan to be Trump's vice president that you have to come to this trial and say nice things about him? Uh, yeah, there may be one or two exceptions to that of people who haven't shown up. But yes, pretty much that's what's going on here. That it's not just allies, but Trump has made very clear from the beginning of this campaign that one of the mistakes he made last time was not picking people who were sufficiently loyal to him, and he's not going to make that mistake again. And so he's made very clear to the people around him that demonstrating fealty is like a top priority. And you see all these potential vice presidential candidates now doing that daily. That's how they're auditioning for the job. 
the other key thing that I think is important to note here is that they're not just showing up and calling this a witch hunt and, you know, aligning with his talking points in that regard. They're also basically helping him skirt his gag order. If you look at the content of what they're saying, they are saying precisely the things that got Donald Trump in trouble on the gag order front before, talking about the judge's daughter, talking about witnesses. Even at one point, Senator Tommy Tuberville said something that seemed like a potential allusion to the jury pool. I am disappointed in looking at the American, supposedly American citizens in that courtroom. These are all things that Trump has said, but have gotten him in trouble. And so he's got 10 gag order violations. He's been more careful since then. And all of a sudden, after he starts being more careful, these people show up and start saying the same things that got him in trouble. And so I think it's it's a pretty remarkable moment when it comes to the Republican Party's kind of growing comfort with attacking the judicial system and doing things like this, because these things that they're saying about the judge's daughter, about the witnesses, et cetera, the reason Trump is not allowed to say those is because the judge says that these could compromise the trial, that it could cause certain mm-hmm. people who are important to this process to feel fear. Um, and so here you have Republicans saying the kinds of things that could still result in those things. They're not bound bound by that gag order. They they can say these things as long as Trump doesn't direct them to. But that question of potential intimidation is still there. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And to the extent that these messages are being driven home willingly by these Republicans, it, it is a remarkable politicization of the justice system. And we've come a long way since back in 2017, 2018, when a lot of these, a lot of Republicans were fighting back against Donald Trump when he was attacking special counsel Robert Mueller. There was a real unease with Trump's attacks on the judicial system, on on prosecutors back then. And that's just completely gone right now. All right. So let's take a pause there. And after the break, we are going to talk about a new strategy in the Trump campaign and a new poll that gives us a bit of a sense of whether this strategy might work. We'll be right back. Okay, so Michael, you and some of our colleagues here at The Post just published a deep dive into the Trump campaign's ground game in 2024 how they're basically ignoring the GOP playbook on how to run a campaign like this. And instead, they've decided to build a much leaner operation. Can you talk a little bit about your reporting here and, like, what leaner means and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we don't know exactly how lean it'll be. But just to give back up a little, give the history, starting in 2016, the RNC rebuilt itself as an organization that did basically two things. It did data for elections and it built a giant field operation for Republican candidates. Now it was Republican presidential candidates, but also down ballot candidates. That meant opening offices in black and Latino neighborhoods. It meant organizing volunteer networks, sort of in the model of what Obama had done in 2012. Uh, that continued, and that and that played a huge role in getting Trump elected in 2016 because he had nothing when he won the nomination. He walked in, suddenly he had this whole operation he could plug into. In 2020, they built an even bigger operation because they had tons of money. He had spent four years fundraising for his reelection, um, tons of offices, tons of volunteers, tons of people. This cycle, they don't have a lot of money, and they have a new FEC ruling that says they can actually coordinate more with outside groups, groups like Turning Point USA and other nonprofits. They can share scripts about what they want to be saying to voters when they knock on doors and things like that. And they have decided that that old strategy, the 2016 and 2020 strategy of a giant in-house field operation is just not as important. And they're not planning to build it. And there have been real concerns in some of these states where state parties who have expected, I mean, there was a playbook the GOP had prepared in January For each state, you would get this many people by this month, this many offices. None of that's come to pass. And so the Mm. states are sitting there saying, well, we we don't have anything. They're seeing what Biden's building, and it's significant what Biden's building. And they're saying, we don't even have organizers in in our big cities at this point. And the Trump campaign and the RNC are saying, stay cool. This is a new strategy. It's going to work. It's going to be great. You know, just hold on. We'll work through this. And how much of this is them 
like thinking that the strategy is going to be more efficient or that they'll be able to, um, I, I don't know, like all, all the all the good connotations of the word lean and how much of this is a reflection of the fact that they just don't have as much money as Biden does and they can't pay for this stuff that they otherwise maybe would have. The money is definitely the starting point. Now, whether it matters and hurts them or whether they can build something that's even more effective, I think is still an open question. They point out, for instance, that everyone already knows who Biden and Trump are. This sort of get out the vote stuff matters most traditionally when you're dealing with candidates that no one knows about. Mm -hmm. You know, you inform someone who's not paying attention to politics about what's going on. Probably don't have to do that much. Other Republicans point out that, you know, the, the campaigns with the largest ground operations, arguably Trump in 2020 and Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016, lost both those races. So it's not these sort of ground up, get out the vote operations in swing states. It used to be referred to as like the field goal kicking team on a football. It's just the three points at the end. It just gives mm-hmm. you that little margin at the end. It's not a huge shift. And but then, the guy that you really don't want to mess up when it comes down to the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you don't want to mess up when you know you're walking into a state that's basically a 50-50 state. There's been a 50-50 state in every election, a state like Wisconsin, in every election going back to, you know, 2016, mm-hmm. you know, give or take a few points. So... I think it's a risk, and it's a risk being made out of necessity. But whether it matters, whether it's consequential, we don't know. We know that Biden, on the other side, is not a classic Democratic grassroots candidate, and he is doing a ton. I mean— Yeah, what does that look like? Describe the opposite of that when it comes to how Biden is thinking about this get-out-the-vote Yeah, so last year and early this year, there was all this concern among Democrats that, you know, where is the Biden campaign? Why is it so quiet? Why aren't they spending any money? The polls are bad. They, in the last few months, have really turned it on. they got more than 400 people in these, uh, I think now, eight or nine states. They have hundreds of offices, and they are doing an aggressive get-out-the-vote campaign. They have a different problem than Trump has right now. Their problem is their base voters, young people, Latinos, African Americans, are not enthusiastic about this election, don't want to vote. And so they have to get into those communities. They have to meet people. They have to make it happen. They're really leaning into the sort of latest in field technology right now, which is relational organizing, basically giving people an app that turns their phones into a get-out-the-vote machine so that they'll have meetings. They'll have a bingo night in Wisconsin in a senior retirement community. And, you know, between the bingo ball winners, they'll tell everybody to get out their phone and text five of their friends, Hmm. post this meme to their... TikTok page. They're doing the same thing at college campuses. They're doing bracelet events at college campuses in Milwaukee. So so it's like the ultimate grassroots. Like here we are, like we're finding the bingo nights. We're finding like the little pockets of community where we can come in and like activate people. And so. it's a technological innovation. I mean, in the old days, I'm really old now, 2008, 2012, you would give volunteers a piece of paper on a clipboard and say, knock these doors, tell them these things. This is a situation where you go into a community And you pick a random person. You say, can you just text the people you know? Can Hmm. you just text your friends? And the research shows that people have sort of stopped answering the phones. People people still answer their doors. But they've sort of tuned out of politics. But if your daughter is calling you or your nephew or your niece or, or the reverse, I mean, young people are less tuned in. Your aunt is calling you and saying, hey, did you see this thing Biden did? Did you see how terrible Trump is? I'm going to be really disappointed in you if you don't, like, register to vote and make it a priority to do this. You at least read the message, Mm -hmm. you know, whereas you probably, you know, are not reading the message if it's coming through other routes. Aaron, I want to come to you here because the narrative that Michael's describing here makes it sound like Trump doesn't have that much money, can't do this get-out-the-vote effort, and, like, maybe that might bite him in the coming months, whereas Biden's campaign is, you know, taking all these efforts to find the bingo night to get people activated. And yet we have this poll out from this past week that suggests that Biden is really the one who's in hot water here. Can you talk about this poll and why it has so many Democrats scared right now? Yeah, I think the thing to remember here is that a tied race nationally is probably not a race that Democrats are going to win. Mm -hmm. And so that's what most recent polls show Biden gaining a little bit in the national polls and something close to a tie race. But the Electoral College has been favoring Republicans for a while now. And we got six key swing state polls in the New York Times on Monday that provided a pretty rare look at how things are, are in those swing states. I think the key takeaway here is that Trump appears to have strength in the Sun Belt states. So those Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, those states that were very close in 2020, Trump is leading by a significant margin in those, not margin of error, but outside the margin of error. 
It's closer in the Midwestern states, the key Midwestern states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. But there's a couple of key things in this poll. One is what Michael was talking about a while ago, is that young voters, black voters, Hispanic voters are not as on board with the Democratic presidential nominee as they have been in basically every recent election, dating back even as far as 1972. The numbers on all three of those groups are just very far afield of where they usually are. Mm -hmm. The second thing that really struck me from this poll was Biden trailed by an average of six points in these six states. But a generic Democratic Senate candidate in those same states led by an average of four points. That is a 10-point gap between how a generic Democrat would do in the Senate race and how Biden is doing. Wait, can I ask about that? for When you say generic Democrat Senate, they were just like, if, yeah, if a senator who is a Democrat ran for office, would you vote for him, him or her? Like, it doesn't matter who it is. Yeah, basically, like, this is how we often gauge things when we are trying to control for the quality of an actual candidate. We'll just say, if it was a generic Democrat or a generic Republican, which one would you want to elect to the Senate? And so what that speaks to is that there is an appetite in these states to vote for Democrats for other office. There is not as much of an appetite to vote for President Biden. And that's a reflection, I think, again, of the struggles that he's having with some of these key Democratic constituencies. If that holds up, if that kind of a gap exists on Election Day, there's just very little chance that Biden would win these states. And that's also one of the reasons why the Biden campaign and Democratic leaders have some optimism here. The polls are bad. No one's disputing that. But if they can create a two, you know, binary choice— Hmm. between Trump and Biden, that gap is probably not because people love Donald Trump. It's because they don't really like Joe Biden. And so they think they can close that gap and most of those votes will end up going to Biden once people are forced to decide between the two people. That's basically the core of the, the Biden campaign strategy right now. Interesting. I also want to hone in for a second on Nevada in particular, because as I understand it, the numbers were particularly stark there to the point that I've heard a lot of conversations this past week of like, Nevada is no longer competitive for Biden. That like the Biden campaign should just give up and spend their money elsewhere because like this is not going to happen for him based on where the poll numbers are now. I mean, is that your read on what this says? I think it's worth, you know, Nevada was kind of the most surprising state here. It was former President Trump by double digits in a state that Republicans have won by, at the most, four points in the last several decades. Mm -hmm. So this would be a shock if Nevada sh really shifted that hard in Republicans' favor. I think I don't want to be like a crosstab truther. There's a movement among Democrats, especially right now, to go into these polls and look for things that don't look quite right about the sample. In this one, there was kind of a weird thing going on where Trump was doing very well in Las Vegas-based Clark County, which is a reversal of how things usually work. But there are reasons to believe that a state like Nevada could be trending towards the GOP, especially if Biden is not doing as well as Democrats usually do, especially with Hispanic voters. You know, Nevada is six electoral votes. So if you're going to take a state off the table, which I don't think the Biden campaign is doing at this point, it's not the most critical one. But to the extent this is a reflection of kind of these other broader trends and that, you know, Biden can't also compete in states like Arizona and Georgia, taking those kinds of states off the table would significantly narrow his path to victory. A Democratic data firm Catalyst did a study of the Nevada outcome in 2020 and found that 40 percent of the voters who voted in the 2020 election were new voters to the state compared mm -hmm. to 2016. And I think both parties kind of expect something similar to happen here. It's a very transient state. You don't go move to Nevada and stay there for the rest of your life. You come through, someone else rents your apartment. Do, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, rents your apartment afterwards. And and it's also a state with, like Aaron said, high Latino, but also lower college education. And one thing we found is that, you know, Biden's doing really well among college educated voters. It helps him in some of these northern states. It's not it's not helping him in Nevada. Interesting. So looking ahead to next week, what will you guys be paying attention to? Well, it seems like we could potentially have, you know, the Trump trial going to the jury or even possibly a verdict next week if things move quickly. There was a sidebar in the case this week where 
Trump's lawyer suggested that they might not even call any witnesses. And Judge Mershon suggested that closing arguments could begin as early as Tuesday of next week. I think that there's been a real, there's some skepticism about how much this all matters. It's the least serious of the indictments that Trump faces. Not many Trump voters say that they would switch their votes if he's convicted. But there is potentially enough of a shift. You know, this is going to be a very close election that's decided on the margins. If being a convicted felon is a deal breaker for 5% of Trump's voters, as some polls suggest, that could be a really big deal. And so I think that verdict is going to be a really significant thing. Whether we get it in the coming week or not, it could be pretty soon regardless. I have a hunch that this debate about debates is not done. <laughs> and uh, we, we've got a few more rounds coming. It, it happened so quickly on Wednesday that everyone just agreed to these debates. The terms were not very clear. The conditions to get an invitation. Again, we talked about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah, this Jr. question of whether he's going to have enough support in the polls to make the case that, like, actually, there should be a third guy on this stage. Has not been very clear. So I think I think we've still got a couple rounds here. And one thing we know about former President Trump is he loves to complain about, <laughs> you know, the rules of these things before he walks in. And, and yeah. so that's something I'm going to be watching. Make sure your hotel reservation is refundable is what Michael's saying. <laughs> I think that's just generally good life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. All right. We're going to have to leave things there. This flew by so fast because it was so much fun. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And Aaron, thank you. Have a great weekend. See you next week. Thanks, Martine. And don't forget to subscribe to the Campaign Moment newsletter. You can find a link to the Campaign Moment newsletter in our show notes and at postreports.com. Aaron Blake is a senior political reporter, and Michael Shear is a national political reporter for The Post. That is it for this week on the Campaign Moment. We are so glad you're listening, however you're listening. For some of you, that's probably via Post Reports, where we've been bringing you these conversations on most Fridays, and we mostly intend to keep doing that. But if you're not yet subscribed to the Campaign Moment podcast, which is a separate podcast feed, you are missing out. We've got a whole plan for more bonus episodes and extras and continuing campaign coverage that you will not get on Post Reports. So definitely take a second, pull out your phone, open up your podcast app, Find the campaign moment and hit subscribe or follow or the plus sign or whatever you need to do to get the alert for this podcast to come up on your phone. All right. So with that, I'm going to tell you about the folks who make this show possible. Today's episode was produced and mixed by Ted Muldoon. It was edited by Renita Jablonski and Mary Jo Murphy. The Post Reports team also includes... Maggie Penman, Rena Flores, Monica Campbell, Lucy Perkins, Alana Gordon, Ariel Plotnick, Bishop Sand, Renny Spranovsky, Sabi Robinson, Emma Talkoff, Sean Carter, Peter Bresnan, Allison Michaels, and my co-host, Alahe Izadi. I'm Martine Powers. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will be back soon with more from The Washington Post. Erin, I just have to say that I'm so impressed with your Kendrick Drake reference. I just feel like you've aged yourself down a whole decade <laughs> with that answer. I'm very proud. What if I admitted to you that I have very little knowledge of what this whole thing is actually about? There's a Post Reports episode about that. You just It's last Saturday. You just got to go back and listen. Okay. It is. I, mean, I, will, get, I will get caught up intense. on this. Yes. <laughs>